it was just supposed to be a quick two hour snatch and grab with our first DA on its deployment was our first DA that was going to be in in the daytime because we had the vampire ops the entire deployment and but this guy was a major HPT that we had been tracking a lot of different people had been tracking for a long period of time and I was one of the source that called me in the middle of, well they called my interpreter while I was sleeping in the daytime and said hey I got eyes on Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today's combat story is one of perseverance and hustle on another level. We hear from Remy Adeleke, who deployed multiple times as a Navy SEAL, but only after coming a truly difficult childhood of being stripped of his family's wealth in Nigeria to hustling on the streets of the Bronx to make ends meet. Remy would be one of those rare people who wanted to become a SEAL even though he couldn't swim, just to give you an idea of his attitude and beliefs. After leaving the service, Remy has done it all. He was contacted by Hollywood and has either acted in or advised on multiple blockbuster movies and shows like Transformers, SEAL Team, and most recently, The Terminal List with Chris Pratt. He's also a best-selling author with a fantastic book, Transformed, a Navy SEAL's unlikely journey from the throne of Africa to the streets of the Bronx to define all odds, and that is a spot-on title. And he owns a clothing line called Kojo Wear and more. This is a true combat story of not just overcoming the odds downrange, but overcoming every obstacle life in the inner city can throw at you. And I hope you enjoy his story as much as I did. Remy, thanks for taking uh, the time to share your story with us today. No, no, thanks for having me, man. It's such an honor and blessing to be on your podcast. And uh, the audience may not know that uh, that I had an issue with some time. So I just want to apologize to you and your audience for uh, being a bit late. <laughs> hey, hey, it's no problem. And actually, I, I wasn't quite sure which direction to take to kick this off. Yeah. But you do have so many different things going on. And we're going to touch on your time with the teams and growing up. Yeah. Yeah. But the term chameleon comes up quite a bit. It's a chapter yeah. in your book, um, yeah. Transformed, yeah. which is yeah. a great book. What does the chameleon mean to you today? Uh, the chameleon to me means flexibility. It means the ability to adapt and overcome uh, to different situations. It's the ability to, uh, to be what you need to be in the moment. Um, it's uh, learning how to read the room. It's, it's a multitude. It's, it's, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, it's flexibility. And a lot of that comes from um, my background growing up, having to be able to bend from a kid in Nigeria to a kid in the Bronx to then bend into how do I survive in this environment in the Bronx and then bend into how do I get into the military and become that become that citizen that's serving his country and then bend into becoming a SEAL and then and then bend and, and I, maybe the word is not bend, maybe it's blend, right? Blend. Yeah. So, blend into you know becoming a civilian and blend so it's this ability to adapt and blend and and you know a lot so a good chunk of that came from my upbringing but then the seal teams you know and the seal teams we have to be able to do different things we have to be a shooter one day but then we got to be a diver one day and we got to be a paratrooper jumping out of a plane one day and then we have to be a humid guy one day so you know so a good chunk of that comes from my upbringing but then it was further perfected in my time in the SEAL teams. And so that's what being a chameleon means to me, is being able to adapt to an environment, to a situation, to a group of people, and still maintain uh, your integrity uh, at the same time get the job done. And just to underscore some of that, that yeah. you just touched on, because you really dive deep in the book, yeah. uh, like you became a SEAL without knowing how to swim up until, yeah. so when, when we talk about like adapting and overcoming yeah. and a chameleon, like that really underscores it for me. Absolutely. I would, I would ask Remy, if you could tell us what is the, if I pronounce it correctly, the Yoruba tribe and what does that mean to you and the family? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, there are multiple tribes in Nigeria and, uh, and, and some of the tribe, a good number of the tribes overlap with other countries uh, in Nigeria, uh, because of the, the, the proximity, um, and uh, the three major tribes in Nigeria are is Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. Uh, 
And so that's the tribe that my dad was born into, which is essentially the tribe, the tribe that I was born into. And, you know, with me, you know, it's, 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 it's because my, especially because my dad was a chief for me, it's a standard. It's a standard of living. It's, 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 it's doing things with excellence, not just to honor myself and my family, but to honor my tribe. You know, I go places all the time. And I, I remember when I was on the ship, I can't remember. I, could, I tried to fit this story into my book, but I couldn't quite fit it in uh, the way I wanted it to. But I remember being on the ship and walking down the halls. And uh, it was like a scene out of the movie um, America, Coming to America, where Eddie Murphy was walking down, uh, was at the basketball game, and he's walking to the bathroom, and these two guys just stopped and he was like, oh, my God, the Prince of King, Prince of King. And I was walking out of all of these two guys. So, because we were, our, our, as you know, being in the military, you wear your last name, you know, this is uh, your tag is on your uniform. And they, these two Nigerian guys stopped. I mean, it was straight from Nigeria, but, you know, they <laughs> came to America and joined the Navy to get citizenship. And it's like, I didn't make it. I didn't make it. You are, I didn't make it. And they started speaking to me in Yoruba. And uh, I, you know, Yoruba is like one of my first languages, but I lost it and having left Nigeria at five. And uh, and I, I was like so sorry and all this. He's like, how do you? How do, are you? I didn't make it. Do not speak your language. Uh, and then when they told me, like, you know, we are so proud of you. You are E four. You are this. You are that. And it's just, it's that it, my name is a Yoruba name. So just being able to being able to have these two men see my name and then automatically know where I come from and know the tribe that I'm a part of and know the standard I should be operating at and see that I am somewhat operating at that standard. It means a lot, you know, you're, it's everything to me because I know that a lot of Nigerians all across the world, when they hear my name, they, they equate that with my tribe and they're expecting success. Right. So um, that's what being Yoruba means to me means giving 110% and not, just honoring my family, but honoring my tribe. So that when people hear the name Adelaide, they're able to continually associate that with success and greatness and putting in the work. So I want to talk about your time in the Bronx, but I don't think we can because it, it, yet, because it's such yeah. a polar opposite experience from what we saw you growing up in Nigeria, right? Yeah. So I, I want to spend just a minute there. And actually I grew up in Zimbabwe. My dad was in oh, the state yeah. department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you describe, kind of like coming down when there's dinner parties going on and all these yeah. important people running around. Like I, I could absolutely relate to that, but yeah. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, what you recall or what your, your mother ended up telling you about your time in Nigeria before we take this kind of significant turn to the Bronx. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, I recall it. I recall it good number of things. I remember the parties, you know, I remember uh, the school. I went to a private uh, school there, um, that, which which was a school that expats and uh, a lot of Brits and, and uh, even kids who's, who, whose parents worked at the State Department and other various agencies sent their kids to um, being, because my mom was American, you know, she wanted us to have that Western education. Um, and uh, so I remember that. I remember uh, uh, my first fight uh, as a kid and uh, right outside the school and uh, my dad was got home my dad was I was expecting him to be upset but he was actually proud of me uh, for sticking up for myself um, I remember the beaches uh, that we lived on we lived in Lagos specifically Victoria Island which is an island so I'm very I remember the beaches and then looking when I see pictures that um, we have from Nigeria I'm able to, my brain gets refreshed as to the things and places we did. So I remember our nanny Jane and we had cars and we had multiple cars and we had drivers. I remember our driver um, who would take my brother and I horseback riding uh, when we had time. So I just, I remember those, those, some, I just remember a life in luxury life where we had absolutely everything and didn't need to need to, to struggle to get anything. Everything was at our beck and call. So that's a good chunk of what I remember. And then maybe just briefly, your father being a chief, I think most Americans will equate that with something that it's not actually the way it's described in the book. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's like Western educated, yeah. flying all over the world, yeah. incredibly influential. If you could just yeah. speak to that for a bit. Yeah, yeah. So my dad's so my role all goes back to my grandfather. So my grandfather was a chief and, uh, and he had eight wives. 
um, which was typical in that culture. And my father uh, and my grandfather kept on having daughters. And, uh, and then my grandmother, so one of my grandfather's wives, uh, finally gave birth to a son. And that son was my dad. So my dad was the firstborn son to my grandfather. So he just naturally inherited the title chief. And he was kind of like raised up as this king who was going to lead, you know, uh, our, our, the Adelaide's into the next generation. And uh, unfortunately, my grandfather died. When he died, my uh, grandmother brought my, uh, my, my father down to the south of Nigeria, uh, closer to Lagos. And um, he... They were Christian missionaries there at the time, and they not only did they teach the Bible, but they taught science and math and, you know, history and a lot of other Western topics, and my dad excelled. He was always very brilliant. My grandfather was Muslim, so my, so my dad was, was made to memorize the Quran at a very young age, and he also memorized the Bible when he got down south. He, was, he had just brilliant memory of being able to memorize things and adapt, you know, and, uh, and so he, you know, he was brilliant in school, ended up, you know, getting a full ride scholarship to study engineering and architecture at London uh, University. So he went there and that's where he started building his, his wealth after he graduated from school. He was like one of the first black men on the board of the World Trade Center in the United States. He was the first black man on the uh, board of the British Financial Planning Council in Great Britain. And, uh, and he was just, he was just a visionary. He was like way ahead of his time. He was able to see things that, that no one else was able to see. And I think a lot of that, and he had the confidence. And I think a lot of that confidence came from the fact that he was cheap. And it came from the fact that his father, his, his father was, was the man who he was. And his father had built a lot of a great legacy. And I think like, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, like my mindset, you know, knowing that I'm a Yoruba, that means to me that I have to operate with excellence and I have to make my people proud. And I think that my dad being the firstborn son, he had that pressure on him. And that's why he was able to excel because he knew not only was he a Euro, but he was also a chief. And so fast forward, he ended up um, moving back back to Nigeria. He kept the place in the States, kept the place in Nigeria and, and London, but he moved back to Nigeria and his main goal was to take all of his knowledge, all of his expertise and essentially make Nigeria what he felt it could be because he felt like Nigeria could be with the oil and, and, and the natural gas and the coal and the cocoa and all of these resources that Nigeria has. He felt that if it was stewarded properly and if, if there was a, a, a centralized place, a business sector um, where everything can, can be funneled through and, 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 and vetted and, and traded and so on and so forth, then Nigeria could be like the, could be, you know, the, the most wealthy country and if not just Africa, but in the world. And so um, that's when he went back to Nigeria and started building his stuff up. But unfortunately things happened the way they happened. But again, I love to answer your question. You know, a lot of my dad's mindset came from that culture. It came from the way he was raised. It came from the mantle that was passed on to him from, from his father, my grandfather. Yeah. And um, I think just with that context in mind, before we make it to you in the seals, there's this significant period in your life where you moved to the Bronx. Yeah. And can you just kind of share the disparity between what you just described with, you know, drivers and the luxury yeah. and the horseback riding, and then what you experience coming and living in the U S after your father sadly passes away. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, right around the same time my dad passed away is when the Nigerian government stripped our family of everything. And then we went from rich to poor. Um, my mother, you know, relocated us to Bronx. And, you know, as I say, as I said, and, and, and uh, many other times, I like my mother did a real good job of masking the reality of what had happened. Um, you know, so, you know, even though we were in the Bronx, you know, she did a really good job of, you know, setting up our apartment so that it was pristine. She had like a lot of my dad's Nigerian art and sculptures around the apartment. And, you know, she, you know, she, she cooked, tried to cook the best food for us. And, and, you know, and so she, and, and she saved her pennies, especially as we got older, she saved her pennies in order to take us to plays. And I remember, you know, she would always talk to us about the importance of knowing how to act when you're in different environments, especially prestigious environments. So, she would save more money to be able to take us to a fancy restaurant. And my brother and I would have to get dressed up and, and, and sit at the table and at the restaurant. And we had to learn which fork to use and all these things, you know, so that that way, 
when, if, and her, you know, for some people, if we ever made it into those worlds that we're, where we were, where we live consistently, then we know how to act. For my mom, it was just more when, you know? Um, and, and so again, my mom did a good job masking the reality. It wasn't until I got about seven, eight years old that I finally realized that my dad was gone um, and that uh, everything that we had was not coming back uh, anytime soon. And, uh, you know, because I would see things, I would see my mom, I would go to the rent office with my mom and watch her beg for um, an extra few days to pay the rent. I would, you know, see my mom, you know, uh, put food on the table for my brother and I, and then, you know, walk away and stand in the kitchen doorway and watch us and not eat because she had just enough food to feed my brother and I would, my mom would give my brother and I a bar of ivory soap and she would say, hey, like, we don't have enough money for laundry detergent and I don't have any coins to do laundry downstairs. So you guys have to take this bar of ivory soap and wash out your underwears and socks and hang them up on the shower uh, pole. And, and so it was those things consistently. And then walking out, you know, you know, walking the streets of Bronx and, you know, and uh, outside of our, you know, where we lived, our community we lived in and seeing crackheads and drug dealers and, the, you know, the mafia guys going into the store to collect taxes and all of these things and people getting murdered. My brother's, you know, friend who was in, elementary school, middle school, if she got murdered in, in the laundry mat because the guy wanted to have sex with her and she wanted, so he murdered her. You know, so, you know, it, it was seeing and getting exposed to those things where that's where I was just like, all right, I'm not in Kansas anymore. But that came years later after I, I, the culture shock didn't come right away because, again, my mom, you know, put a Band-Aid on it the best she could, but eventually, you know, the wound needed more than just a Band-Aid. And, and uh, I found out the world I was in, and that's that's when it finally hit me. So, and even today, you've got so many things going on. You're a writer, yeah. actor, I mean, mm -hmm. making a school, like all, yeah. all kinds of work that's happening. Yeah. Even back then, though, it seems like you always had five or six things going. You were hustling yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Like, what do you remember that, like, what were some of the more useful hustles that you ran, even if they were borderline yeah. illegal or yeah. not? But that kind of taught you what you, what you need yeah. to learn. A lot of them were actually legal. <laughs> um, you know, I remember my mom, she, I can't remember. I want to say we were probably, probably nine and 10 years old. And uh, we had a neighbor who asked us to help him move some, he had like a bunch of junk in his apartment. And he tried to, he asked us to help, asked my brother and I to help him move it. And then he gave us, gave us like $5 each or something like that. And, uh, and my mom got this idea, you guys should start a business and call it B and R Aaron and messaging service. And, uh, you know, my brother's name is Byron Remy. So that's why she said B and R Aaron. And so we started this business where we would just do odd jobs, like, you know, to, you know, wash people's cars in our building and like, you know, take messages to certain places and like, you know, clean people's houses and just do crazy stuff. So that was like one of the first hustles that I started out with. Um, the second, the next thing, you know, I was, I was I, the next thing I did was stealing. I mean, I would steal, start out stealing at the local corner store, you know, which was a little side hustle. And, and then that progressed to, you know, when I worked at the sneakers job, sneakers store, um, coming up with this elaborate scheme where, and this is when credit cards started being used. I mean, it was like to have a credit card was like, that was like, you had to be rich to have a credit card. And I remember, and then before I worked with me, first of all, I lied to get the job. You had to be 16 to get the job. I would say I was 15. And I lied to the man, and my manager, her name was Misha. I never forget, beautiful woman. She was like a West Indian, you know, short, short hair, beautiful woman. And I lied to her, and but she gave me the job because I was taller, so I guess she thought I was older. And uh, I remember people would always come in and pay with cash. And, and then and then suddenly it's time, like over the months, people started paying with credit cards. And uh, I just remember, and I was, I, was, I was literally working like in Times Square, the sneaker store was in Times Square, right off of Times Square. I, I want to say in Times Square, like literally right there in Times Square, like about 40, I want to say 47th, 48th Street. And uh, uh, I would uh, have people come in and when they, when they, um, I wanted to pay with credit card, I would convince them to pay with cash. 
I would say, you gave, if you would give me, uh, the sneaker costs $90, you give me $70 cash, I'll not pay on a credit card, I'll give you the sneakers. And I'll just run it through, I'll give you a dollar time, I'll give you a, a discount in the system. When in reality, I was putting the money in my pocket and I made so much money doing that. I made so much money. And I remember I was in high school and everybody knew me in high school because I was the kid that could get you Jordans or get you whatever sneaker you wanted for like, you know, uh, you know, uh, half of the price or not, you know, you know, a third of the price knocked off. And how uh, are you replacing the inventory then? Like I, what I would do. So uh, it was this, it was in, a, uh, in the, uh, I forgot what they call it, not warehouse, but it was a stock room. In the stock room, there were these boxes that would get picked up like every month. And these boxes were called the defect boxes. The, the, and, and so it was shoes that were that had like defects in them or that had like, you know, uh, you know just some type of defect. So what I would do was I would take the uh, the shoes that the people took off their feet because that was another thing that I would do. I would make them take the shoes off their feet and give them to me. I say, hey, it's a recycling thing. I would put those shoes in a box and I would hide them in this pile of uh, defect shoes. Right. So when the guys came to pick up the defect shoes every three, four, whatever, I can't remember. I mean, you got to remember this is like yeah. 40. So this is this is 30 almost, man, this is 25 years ago. Um, and so when they would come pick them up, um, you know, they weren't going to sift through all of these boxes of, of shoes. They were just grabbing the boxes and going. And for the most part, trashing. So they were trashing shoes. So I would just write them off. I, was, I would just essentially write it all. Oh, this was a defective box. And that's how I was able to kind of get away with the inventory thing. But I was being young and stupid. I went overboard. I went overboard. And, uh, you know, uh, I, and I ended up quitting that job. I went overboard and ended up quitting because I realized that if I stayed, it would eventually come back on me. You know, so, so I, you know, I was always smart about, you know what, and this this comes from discipline. See, my mom would 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 spank my brother and I, you know, when we when we messed up. And you know, people nowadays are more so against spanking than before. But my mom would spank us, and and the good thing that came out of that is I knew that if I did wrong, I would get discipline. I would like I would get some type of proverbial spanking. And so what that that instilled in me was this idea of consequences for action. So I knew that whatever action I did. No matter how you know bad it was, or even if how much, no matter how much I tried to hide it, I knew that eventually there would be some type of consequence for it. And so my way of avoiding the consequence was let me get out of here before the consequence came. Right, and that, you know, whereas other people, and again, that all came from my mom spanking my brother not relentlessly whereas I don't I think if I never did this thing I would just continue going and going and going and going and not think that you know a consequence is going to come and then stay there and end up in jail or prison right so I was always good about saying all right I'm going a little bit overboard it's time for me to pop smoke um before this plane crashes (laughs) and it's again and again right I mean it's with the cell phones with the drugs drugs everything each time so yeah, buddy of mine, I sold drugs, which is still in prison right now. He's in prison right now. You know, Roderick, he, Roderick's in my book. He's in there. Me and him sold drugs together. He's he's in prison. Um, and I get phone calls from him. I haven't gotten a phone call from him about a year, but before that, I would get phone calls from him every week. Um, but he, I think he has like another five, six years on his prison sentence. And he went from one prison in Philadelphia, got out. He did five years there, five, six, seven years there, and got out. And then as soon as he got out, the, uh, the, the, the cops came and picked him up and sent him to New Jersey to do his prison time in New Jersey because he had charges <laughs> oh there. God. And that, that would have been me. And, you know, yeah. and the thing with Rod, kind of like, you know, with me, he didn't have, like, he was, he jumped from foster home to foster home and never really had somebody who actually cared about him and, and discipline. So he would live, he lived with me and my mom, you know, sometimes, you know, he because he didn't have a place to stay, but he never had had that person to say, hey, dude, you need to chill out. And, uh, you know, and they caught a wolf him. So. And in this environment, what on earth um, makes you think that the military is a way to go? Um, you know, God, for me, is because of that was not, it, it was nothing in my mind or my psyche that pointed me to the military or as and, a way. And not in your family, right? 
No, 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 like, no, no, not really. Well, my, my, my mom's half brother, um, we call him brother. My mom called him brother. That was his nickname. He was in the Korean War. Um, and he, uh, but he, he got a, a great, more is more to the story, but the short of it is an explosion happened nearby. Uh, I don't know if it was a grenade or he was in a tank or whatever. And he had permanent brain damage. So from the time, he, from the time of the, him getting exfilled out of Korea, he was in a veteran's hospital. And he was a, pretty much a vegetable until the day he died. And I remember we kids, my mom took us there maybe about three or four times to the veteran hospital to see him. And, you know, he was just not there, you know, feeding tube, everything. His eyes were moved, but he was just, you know, a mess, you know. And, but that was my only real um, family connection to the military. Other than that, you know, I, I had an uncle who served, but, you know, a distant uncle who served in Vietnam. But for the most part, I had no real consistent person in my life who was actually in the military or talked about the military. So where does it come in to, in your journey? I think, you know, it was, a. I was at the bottom. I think I, you know, I had tried to make it in the music business. I had tried to make it in uh, the legal business that I was doing and it didn't work out. And I, I think I finally, a big part of it, Again, a lot of it goes back to God's guidance, but the, the reality is, I think it came down to I had to make a decision to get out of the Bronx, and the most realistic decision was the military, because even though I had no desire to be in the military, because um, if not, I end up dead on prison, you know. And uh, and you know, I had watched movies in the past, which really spoke to me, like you know, Bad Boys. Um, I came out, I want to say 96. That was a film that really showed me that, you know, I could be any, I could be, I don't have to be a drug dealer or athlete or, you know, uh, you know, do the things I'm doing. I could be a hero and I could be cool um, because that was the first film where I uh, saw two black men who looked like me and they came from kind of somewhat the same environment, but they were cool and they were had swagger and they acted like me and they were heroes. And that was the first time I was just like, huh, like I could be a hero. And then the second film was uh, The Rock. That was the first time I was exposed to Navy Seals. And I watched that film and I said to myself, I was, had to be about 15, 16 at the time. I said, if I ever turn my life around, that's what I would do. I would be a SEAL. And again, it was just like, it wasn't something where I was like, I'm absolutely going to do this. I was like, if this ever happens, and I know I'm probably never going to turn my life around, but if I was to, I would do that, right? And so that's kind of what, uh, I think those seeds kind of, you know, merge with the, with the um, idea that I had nothing going on in my life and that I was probably going to end up dead or in prison if I didn't leave the Bronx is what essentially led me into the military. God. So, so, so one of the things that really surprised me in the book that, I mean, I've interviewed 80 vets now and almost every time we talk about where were you at on 9-11 and they all, yeah. and obviously you're New York born. It doesn't even come up for you, though. It's not like, oh, 9-11 happens. And so yeah. I need to go in. Like yeah. you're still you're you're trying to run your, your record label like yeah. to, to get signed by a label. Yeah. And you don't join until the following year. Right. So yeah. what what was 9-11 like for you? And if yeah. was it just to the side? Yeah. No, no, I was uh, I was in my apartment. At, uh, well, not my apartment, I was in my mom's apartment in my bedroom. And um, and my mom, I was asleep. And my mom rushed into my room and woke me up. She was like, you can't believe this. Like, it's, it's under attack and, like, the Twin Towers and this and that. I was like, what are you talking about? And my mom tore, turned on the news in my room and showed me. I was like, wow, it was crazy. And I remember a girl I was dating at the time. Her cousin worked at Windows of the World. And she lived, like, two buildings about three buildings down from me. And uh, and and uh, Windows of the World, for those who don't know, is a restaurant, what well, was a restaurant at the very top of uh, one of the towers, you know, which one. And uh, she had, uh, the girl who worked at the restaurant had two kids. And so um, this girl I was dating, you know, we, I went to her building and we went on top of the roof because we lived uh, in the complex I lived in. Uh, there were 17 floors in each building. It was pretty high. And so we went to the, we went to the, what would have been the, the uh, 18th floor of the roof and, um, and, and, and looked at the towers and we watched the towers smoke and we watched the towers come down from the roof. No way. 
Yeah, yeah. Her cousin was never found. Her cousin was never found because um, her cousin was in the restaurant, in the windows of the world restaurant when uh, the towers got hit. So, and uh, kids were orphaned, orphaned. So that was my, that was my day, you know? And obviously I was like, you know, it was crazy because it was, uh, you hear, you know, fire trucks and police cars, you know, sirens going to and fro all over the place and, and like people in the streets. It was, it was nuts, man. It was like, uh, it was like Armageddon almost, you know? Um, and it was, there was an anger in me um, when it happened, you know, to, to want to fight in some way. Cause I always hated bullies. Ever since I was a kid, you know, I just always hated bullies. And uh, like the fact that somebody would just bully, bully and, and kill innocent people didn't sit well with me. And like a part of me was like, dang, like I wish I could just go do something. Um, but then that faded because my priority was let me, you know, I want to make money. I want to yeah. make a YouTube business. So that's kind of how it faded away. I got you. No, it makes total you had so much going on then. Like yeah. Yeah. that wasn't the priority. Okay. So I want to transition into the military side. And as we go there, I want to just ask you about Petty Officer Reyes. Yeah. Um you do such a good job of bringing this person to life in the book. I yeah. just was hoping you could share a little bit about that here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I went to go join the Navy, there's a lot more to the story. Everybody can get in the book, but the short of it is I went to go join the Navy and uh, Tiana Rez, she was the recruiter and in the office that I went to. And she ran my background, kind of like I had two warrants out for my arrest. I didn't even know I had warrants. I had a warrant in New York and I had a warrant in New Jersey. And I uh, got up and got ready to run out of the office after she told me. And um, I, I, uh, she stopped me at the door. She said, she said, what are you doing? I said, get out of here because I'm going to feel like going to prison today or jail. And she said, well, if you go out that door, you're going to end up there. Like, there's nothing out there for you. And so I turned around and like, well, what, what, what are you talking about? And she said, let me help you. And essentially, you know, uh, she asked me if I had a suit and tie. I said, no. She said, you have a collar shirt and some nice pants. I said, yeah, I can find some. She said, come back tomorrow. And I was like, for what? She said, just come back tomorrow. And I came back the next day. And uh, she took me to both judges. She took me to the judge in um, New Jersey and the judge in New York. This story is drawn out a little bit longer because it didn't happen over the course of one day. But she took me to both judges and advocate on my behalf. We st- I stood in front of the judges and she said, hey, this guy's trying to join a military act and act of war. 9-11 just happened. Um, and uh, he's made some mistakes, but he has some potential. And, you know, I'd love to see him in the Navy and see him turning his life around. And both judges, again, I'm paraphrasing, but both judges essentially said, well, if he's serious about turning his life around uh, and joining the military, then we'll clear his record. So that's kind of how I got my record in both states cleared. Uh, I just had to pay uh, court fees and court fines. And then she went a step further and fudged the paperwork, which snuck me in because even though I had, even though I had my record expunged, I still had to record what the crimes that I did. And sometimes, in some cases, it can be worse to have an expunged record and join the military than it can be to have an open record. Because if you committed a crime and that record and that crime has been expunged, and the military doesn't know what it is, and they don't know what you did, you could murder somebody, you could rape somebody, you could do something. They want to know what type of person is coming into the military. So at times it could be harder to get in with an expunged record than it can be with something, you know, as minor as like misdemeanor, you know, running a red light, because that's something the military could see and say, oh, you just ran a red light, you haven't had that, that issue again. We will clear that and let you in. But um so she had to fudge the paperwork and say that I never even had a record and sign off on it. And she did. And uh, that's how I got in the Navy. And if it wasn't for her, you know, I would have. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know where I would be because it was that one decision that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And, you know, she died two years after that. She died of a uh, super rare autoimmune disease. No. Two years later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She oh. died of autoimmune disease. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm close with her family. Her daughter has become like my daughter. Her daughter was two when she died. So her daughter Sierra is like 16 now. So we communicate. I'm very, very tight with her mom and her dad and her brother Mario. So, um, so yeah, you know, I'm, 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 I'm oh. still connected to her through her family. It is pretty interesting. A lot of the guys I talk to, the stories of what goes on in the recruiter's office yeah. are always memorable. And like you're yeah. sitting there looking for the Marine recruiter, doesn't show yeah. up. And now, you know, you go on to this career as a SEAL. So yeah. 
Wow, that's really interesting. All right, now, now we got to talk about how you go to become a SEAL without knowing yeah. how to swim. Yeah. Um, how, how does that come about? How do you learn that skill to that level when people assume you have to be a phenomenal uh, swimmer yeah. to do that? Yeah, you just do, I mean, for me, it's just as simple as doing the work. You know, I think everybody has a deficiency uh, uh, as it relates to their dream. What, everybody who has a dream has some type of deficiency. Uh, they, that they have to overcome in order to achieve that dream. If not, it wouldn't be called a dream. You know what I mean? And it may not necessarily be a deficiency. It may just be a massive hurdle, you know, like, you know, trying to get a movie made, you know, it's a massive hurdle. It's not going to be easy. If it was easy, it wouldn't be considered a dream. And, 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 and the one thing that I learned growing up in the Bronx and watching my mom work hard is that when you have a hurdle or a deficiency as it relates to reaching your dream, you can do one or two things. You can either give up and essentially say, you know what, this is impossible. I'll never be able to achieve it. Or you can do the extra, extra hard work in order to overcome that obstacle or that deficiency. And for me, it was just one plus one equals two. It's like if I, if I just get to the pool every day and jump in and, and put in the work and try my best and, and keep training, keep training, keep being consistent, and eventually I'll get it down. And that's what I did. I didn't have a car. So I would run three miles in the pool, starting in the shallow end and, and try and I had a lot of bad days, but I would just, you know, work it the best I could. And then I would run my three miles back to my barracks. And, you know, and then finally I humbled myself and I would ask the lifeguard to talk me through the proper stroke. And he, he would talk me through the proper stroke from the lifeguard tower. And then, you know, I would do it. It was freezing. Camp Pendleton gets cold, especially in the wintertime. And I remember it being freezing cold and it's an outdoor pool. And I just remember just getting there and getting after it, not letting the cold keep me or not letting the fact that I didn't have a car keep me in my barracks. And I just did the hard work. And, uh, and that's how I was able to overcome it. It was just, it's just, I did the hard work. And that's something I try to preach to young people all the time. It's like, you just got to do the hard work and it's not, and it's, it's not going to happen right away. I think we live in a society now as it relates to social media, where so many young people think that, you know, things come into, you know, like Instagram, but things come quick. They don't realize that it takes years and years of rejection. It takes years of, 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 of failure. It takes years of being miserable, questioning, doubting. It takes years of that before you can, you know, um, get to where you want to be in life. And even just looking at, just looking at me working in the film and TV industry, like, the biggest reason why I got into the film and TV industry, and, I, and I'm not saying my motivation, I'm saying the big, the thing that got me hired, that got me the job, that had people reaching out to me was the fact that I had this experience in special operations. And so, you know, uh, so if we really look at it, you like, you know, it took it, it, my journey towards special operations started in 2002. I didn't get my first film until 2016. That was by accident because I wasn't even trying to be in the film and TV industry. So we do the math. That's 14 years of, of, of work that I had to do, which I didn't know what it was preparing me for to get me aware I'm in the business. And then I've been in the business for, you know, six years now. So, and it's just now where I'm, I'm, I have even more, more greater success but we do the math man we're talking we're talking 20 years to get to this point and a lot of the kids you know they see me on social media i get messages all the time from young people oh, i want to be an actor oh, i want to be a writer i want to be a director i want to be this and that and they're just on day one and they're just asking for a quick handout and it's like you're not going to get the handout uh, you know it doesn't work that way so you know back to the question you know it, 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 how did i work from swimming i just did the work day in and day out, when it was miserable, when I was cold, when I was tired, when I got off work and, you know, and, and you know, I didn't feel like running three miles. When I have a car, I just did it. And then it worked itself out, you know? Um, so one of the things I did not read through your combat experience in the book, because I like to keep yeah. that somewhat um, close hold until we talk. Yeah. So I've read all the way through Buds, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Can you tell us about the first time you're in a combat environment, what's it like? Where are you at in your career? Like, what year are we talking? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was pretty much right, right after I graduated. I went in, uh, you know, I got to, I got to um, uh, my team, 
and and did a workup cycle and then deployed, you know, deployed and, you know, was in the Middle East, was in a combat zone, doing nothing but direct action missions. That was a, that was a task for our platoon. So DAs, you know, getting in and hitting targets and wrapping up HVTs, high value targets. And I got to live the best of both worlds because, you know, I was a human guy. I had, you know, like I was one of the lucky ones where, you know, when I got to my platoon, I wanted to go to, there was a specific term name for it. I think it's still classified, so I can't mention it, but I went, I requested to go to this human school. It was one or two deployments applied to the school. Uh, they kind of like want to be a sniper or a breach or whatever. And so I, uh, I was like, Roger that, you know, so I just was to the medic. And then um, at the end of ULT, we got Intel um, passed down to us that, we needed our platoon because of where we were going and we were going to be like in the middle of nowhere and had to be self-sustaining. They needed an extra human guy in the platoon. Uh, I think they needed two extra human guys. And so I went, so my OIC approach was like, Hey, do you want to, do you want to, I know you asked for this, you know, when you checked into the team, are you interested? And I was like, absolutely. And I remember I went to the screening uh, process, which was, a, which was crazy in and of itself. Like it was just, you were in an interrogation room. I can't say the stuff that, that, that happens. It's just an interrogation room with three guys working in that field and uh, you're getting grilled and you're getting grilled pretty hard. And, uh, um, and I made it through the screening process, got a waiver, went to the school. And then, like I said, when I got down range, I was able to live the best of both worlds. So I was able to like, you know, run sources and, and gather intel and, and do all of this stuff, and meet with people, and do all of this stuff. Well, one minute, and then the next minute, I was able to, you know, man, I'm obviously going to my skiff and type up these long intel reports, which helped me as a writer big time. Was writing, yeah. you know, learning that type of creative writing. Passed those those reports up the chain of command, and different agencies at times, and generals and stuff, and and that, and then that intel had to be better, and that intel is what led to operations. So I got to do that on one end, and then on the other end, I was able to kick down doors, you know, be the dude that was, you know, because of the intel that was gathered, kick down doors. So it was a, it was incredible. I enjoyed it. Uh, it, it, it was it was li- literally living a dream, man. Like especially coming from where I came from, and you know, you know, sneaking into an HVT's house in the middle of the night and dragging him out of his out of his dreams into a nightmare. You know, you can't you can't uh, you can't pay for that you know there's there's, there's no there's no you can't pay for that fun you know and, and you know and making a difference you know that was one of the reasons why i wanted to be part of special operations because you know every other every branch of service infantry in mad respect because i served in the infantry as a corpsman with the first Marine division but you know everybody plays their part but being in special operations you get to really like do those jobs and make a difference you know everybody makes a difference but you're you're for sure making oh, a difference for sure. Um, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed, you know, and, and been shot at, shot back, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, man, I mean, most, a lot of stuff I can't talk about, but you know, living in that world was was fun. For sure. Could you? I, I'd be interested to hear. It, it's always it's always interesting to hear about people's first time when they're outside the wire, like yeah. after all the training's done, and you really have to go do this job for the first time. What's it really like? So I wonder, could you take us there, Remy, for whatever that first experience was yeah. outside the yeah, wire? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. My first experience outside the wire was I, because I was a new guy and it was my first op, like I was the freaking, um, I was the gun, I was a Humvee gunner. And I just remember I was like, like I was, I was sucked about it was I wasn't a wrong target. And because uh, it was it was a turnover, it was a turnover. Op. We were I think we were leaving Team One, and uh, um, I just remember being in the, the Humvee fifty cal gunner, and I just was like, you know, we drove off the we drove off the five, and we're going through, and I'm just like, part of me was like, damn, like I'm on first op, and I'm gonna get smoked. <laughs> like well, I'm gonna get the gunner, and I'm thinking about you know Black Hawk down with the gun with the, with the uh, gunners at you know with the 50 cal gunners and all these, you know and they get shot. I was like I'm gonna get. I was a first thought like I was like I'm gonna get smoked on my first hop as a freaking 50 cal gunner because I'm like super exposed. You know what I mean? Uh, and then you know uh, the platoon, the team, my team hit the target. 
and they, they pulled off a bunch of, they pulled a lot of, uh, they got a guy and they pulled off a lot of, uh, 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 you know, bombing. Like, dang, like, I did it. Like, you know, we, we got stuff done, but at the same time, I was like, dang, but I did And because when they went to go hit the target, like, they dismounted, and I'm sitting there, like, you know, you know just sitting there, like, <laughs> scanning, just, you know what I mean? Scanning my 50 cal, you know, having my fuel of fire, just making sure, you know, there's, you know, you know sniper, or, you know, people, this was at night, but still, you know, the guy was going to pop out on the roof and start smoking me, so I was scanning and doing that, but it was, it was fun, man. It was fun. It was, it, I was a bit nervous again because of the position. Position I was in because you know I always like to be the guy that's like you know I'm in control when I'm on the ground moving to a target doing that sort of thing and just to be sitting there like a uh, you know head wide out and open you know it was kind of like uh, nerve wracking a bit but yeah. it was great man it was great. and I, I should have asked this before was what was the experience like being an African American in the SEAL teams like did yeah. it matter at all as you got there. No, no. I mean, uh, it, what, the, the one thing I love about the team, especially starting in Buds, is that that was the first real institution I felt like I was a part of where it was just all about, can you do the job? Like how all merit based, hundred percent. All merit based. Like yeah. if you're black and you're, you're great at your job, you know you get. And I was, you know, I was not to I'm not trying to my own horn or anything like that, but I was, you know, I was. My first year of the team, I was, you know, a Navy SEAL, a junior Navy SEAL of the year. And my second year of the team, you know, I was like picked up for a national level op, you know, and then even you know, third year for the team, I was picked up for something else. So it was like, you know, it was all based off your head. Well, no, second year of the team, I not only was, you know, second year of the team, I was promoted early. I got an EP and was promoted early. And then my next year, my next uh, year is when I was picked up for a big national level mission. And then and it just progressed from there. And that was where it was just like, no, it's all about it's not about the color of your skin. It's about can you get the job done? Can you do your job and do it with excellence? And you know, and if you can, if you suck, and regardless of your race, you, you suck, and you're going to get handled as such. And so, you know, I, uh, yeah, I didn't have, I didn't have any issues in the community with, with my race. As a matter of fact, it was like this is one of those things where, like, because there's so I think less than one percent of seals are African American. Not just less than one percent of seals, less than one percent of special operations you know, are African-American. And uh, so, like, guys look at that like, holy crap, like, you know, like, yeah, I'm talking about guys in the team. It's like, holy crap, that's so cool. Like, like especially my story where I came from Africa and the Bronx, yeah. it fascinated people. And they were just like, dude, like, you know, big respect to you for coming from where you came from and, like, making it into this community. And then, you know, it helped me being black helped me downrange, really, especially in the field that I was in the human. It helped me exponentially. Because, yeah, can you talk about that? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah because, um, um, you know, coming from the inner city in the Bronx, well, one, like, as a human guy, a lot of other, the sources that I would run, the sources that I took on and run, they were, they were normal with seeing the white guy with the beard. Right, they were normally seeing a white guy with a beard because there's not that many African American seals. And then when you start getting down into like human work, I mean, because less than one percent of seals are African American, now you you really cut it down. And so in some places, I was the first African American that some of these guys saw because I was seeing people face to face, sitting down, breaking bread with them, having you know gathering intel. You know, I remember the agency having a meeting up in um, up in Baghdad one day at the agency. You guys had to use this massive palace that you guys had. It was, it was Saddam's palace. You guys had taken over. I don't know if you remember, it was, it was in Baghdad when Saddam's massive palace and the CIA had taken over and turned into their own um, compound. And uh, I just remember, like, meeting with agents, and they had never, you know, seen a guy, you know, from my background, you know, and, 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 and as a CEO, I'll never forget it, Cinco de Mayo, you know, being uh, poolside at the CIA compound, uh. you know, with... Uh, with like two CIA agents that were by this pool, like literally it was nighttime. I'll never forget it. Uh, uh, I don't drink beer, but these, these agents brought out Coronas. So we had Coronas and it was this pool that was lit and, and it was beautiful. And it was just like, it was like being at a resort. And uh, these CIA agents brought out these Coronas and it was a bar like right outside, right outside, like right outside, right, not outside, but right next to the pool. 
was this bar and this club that you guys had. So you had the bar and a club, and then you walk out the bar and a club and these big doors, and there's this pool right there. And I'll never forget it being out there, like, damn, how the hell did I get, <laughs> did I get here? <laughs> uh, but but again, going back to my job, it really helped me because you know, coming from the inner city, I was at a level of empathy that I had for people in these war-torn countries and these people who were like in their kind of inner city. And, and so there was this connection I had with them. And then, you know, you know, a lot of them did it, never saw a black guy. So when they saw me and they, my complexion and my complexion is not exact to theirs, but close. They, I felt like they, were, they felt like they could open up to me more. At least that's what, that was the sense I got. It was like, oh, cool. Cause I, I was intriguing to them. And so I was able to get a lot of intel that way. You know, um, so it helped me. I was thinking that, I think that first time when you rotate in, you mentioned that you have a a set of sources that you're about to take over and you kind of have to vet them yourself, like make sure that they're still at the par. I was thinking, given the the hustling you did growing up, you must have been able to smell bullshit from a mile away. 100%. 100%. And, and, and growing up in the Bronx, like if anything, if, if the Bronx did just one thing for me in my life, it didn't work one thing for me, but if it just did one thing for me, it taught me how to, how to smell lies. You know, like I was able to, I learned how to read people because you got to learn how to read people. Right, you that's it. I mean, you're walking down the streets and it's just like, is this guy going to kill me? Is this guy who he says he is? Should I say this? Should I keep my mouth shut? Because this guy might have a gun. Like, is this guy trying to hustle me a lot of me to get money out of me? Like, and that's all stuff that you got to learn to freaking survive. You know what I mean? So when you when you grow up that way and then you get into this environment where you're sitting face to face with a with a source or somebody who, I mean, you know how it is, where, you know, you get people who send in, you know, from double agents, people will say these sources, but they work for the opposition to just, you know, do counter surveillance, gather and tell on you. And uh, um, I was able to, I was able to tell, I was able to tell right away. I was able to, this guy's lying to me. This guy wants to tell the truth. He's just scared. Um, this guy, you know, uh, uh, hates my guts. And doesn't even want to be here, you know, but he's doing it for some type of alternative motive. Um, this guy just, I mean, you know how it is. This guy just wants money. Yep. I guess so the motivation is just money and money. And so it's like all of these things, I mean, it helped me. It's an asset to me. You know what I mean? My, you know, my, my, my uh, upbringing was an asset, you know, when I was dealing with assets. When, when you were going in, so obviously you go on for a direct action, it's you and a team of SEALs and maybe some more folks. But when you're going to meet a source, I'm assuming it's you and maybe your translator that's out there kind of on your own. How could you, like, do you remember the first time you went out for one of those and what that felt like? Well, the first time I went out, it was, it wasn't just me and my translator because it was a guy who was turning over the guy who had been Uh, the sources so it was it was it was a number of it was a number of us it was uh it was a guy who was doing a turnover then it was it was his uh, you know i'm trying to be careful of the term but it's actually his boss and then it was his interpreter and then it was an interpreter that ended up becoming my interpreter and then it was me and my boss um just saying that because can't mention the type of name, yeah. and um, and so it was. It was a it was a group of us, you know, and 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 so that first experience was was uh, a lot of listening and learning and seeing how they did things, and you know, kind of figuring out how I'm going to do things moving forward with this particular guy. And then obviously, you know, like for every source you have, you got to do these turnovers. So it's 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 like it wasn't just one meeting like that. Yeah. It was and then finally is when you know towards the end when I was able to do, you know, um was able to do my one-on-one. But I'm trying to remember if I yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely me an interpreter. So I want to say one-on-one, I mean, you know. For sure, yeah. You gotta have the, the yeah. interpreter there. Yeah, yeah. But I mean you're out on your own. I was just curious if even though you're with your interpreter, yeah. was it did it remind you of some of the streets that you used to have to like walk down in the Bronx as you described them at night? Like, don't know if you're going to make it down the street. Was it that, was it scarier being down in a war zone no, like I that? Mean, you know, like, like, 
at the end, of, just in general, in general, operating and going into another country that's a war zone in general, like as far as fear, that all went away when I chose to be a frog man. Like when I like I think, interested. I think like when you choose, this is just for me. Yeah. When you choose to do this job, you already know. Okay, like you know, I'm I'm in, I'm coming in the buds in 2006, 2007, right? So I, you know, uh, well, the second time because the first time I was in buds, I got dropped to die phase, and then you know that was 2002, and then went back in 2006, 2007, and so when I was in, I already knew about you know stories of stents. I already knew about the job. I knew how dangerous it was. I, knew, I heard the stories of guys who died in training. I heard the stories of guys who died on ops. And then, you know, going back, you know, more so, like, there were guys who I, was, who I went to buds with who, the first time, who got killed. Mikey Monsoor. Uh -huh. Mike, we were in the same boat. We won a Medal of Honor. Um, Mark Lee. Mark Lee, I was in buds with him the first time. He got gets the Silver Star. So I already knew going into this job that I could die. So like the I, the concept of, of being scared of death had already been purged out of me the moment I made the decision to do the job. So instead, the fear is not death. That you have to give that up, in my opinion, to make the decision to start the process to do this job. Instead, the fear for me was doing something or not doing something that would lead to the death or serious injury of my team. If there was any fear, it was that. It was making a mistake that would lead to a guy to my right or my guy to my left and getting killed. It was not doing something that would lead to a guy to my right or to my left being killed. That was all fear. As far as like going into these places and going into these dark alleys and, and, and going into these rural areas where you're outnumbered and you by yourself doing all these things like that it can be the hood or it can be the, like, that's gone. That's, it, it's, yeah. it's like, dude, if you get, like, for me, if I had that fear, you know, that I should probably have chosen a different job. You couldn't operate like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that wasn't, that wasn't even the issue. Like, I, I, I came to terms with death. And I still, I'm still, I'm coming to terms with death. My only issue with death now is, like, it's not, it's not about me. It's about, damn, I got four kids. You know what I'm saying? So if I die, like, you know, like, man, well, where, where are my four kids going to be? Like, how am I, you know, because they, yeah, I want them to, I want to raise them. So it comes, when it comes to death, it's not like, I don't have a personal fear of death. It's just, it's more of what's going to happen to my kids. Like, who's going to be there to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes that I made and be upstanding citizens? Mm -hmm. So that's what it's about. That's what it's about. And then, no, that makes total sense. As, as you think back, to some of the ops that you were on, whether they were direct action or running sources, were there any that come to mind that were particularly difficult, dangerous, or like you knew going into them, this is going to go, this could really go sideways? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of those. I mean, a few of those actually. I mean, there's one where it was just supposed to be a quick two hour snatch and grab. It was our first DA on this deployment, it was our first DA that was going to be. In, in the daytime because we had the vampire ops the entire deployment and but this guy was a major HPT that we had to track and a lot of different people had been tracking for a long period of time and I was running the source that called me in the middle of, well they called my interpreter while I was sleeping in the daytime and said hey I got eyes on this particular target and um, uh, I was literally about to go back to sleep but I was just like because we had tried catching this dude like so many times and he had so many people in pocket that it was just like, uh, I was just like, well, as soon as we freaking mount up, I mean, we tried to get this dude at night at times. And I was like, as soon as, as, soon as we mount up, he's going to get tipped off and, 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 and it's, it's just going to be a dry hole. Um, but like, long story short, you know, that, that what was supposed to be a quick snatch and grab, like literally from the time planning the ops at the time, getting on target and getting to do it off and getting back to file was supposed to be probably an hour or less. And that turned into a 14 hour kick in the freaking nuts. No way. Foot yeah, chase. Can you talk us through what happened on that. Foot chase. I mean, got 
had I'm trying to be careful, but had the source marked the marked the the, the, the target's vehicle, um, you know, in a specific way. You know, there's a drone overhead, so we had to do something. So we were told follow drone follow this vehicle to. And this is daytime, Remy. Like you guys are daytime. usually out at night. This you is daytime. Work, you only work at night this entire. Damn. Day. Yeah. How'd you infill? Was it by air to try to get no, the vehicle? No, no, we cut it by air because again, this. I mean, he would have been tipped off. So we we actually we actually went in through vehicles because I think our thinking was he knows that we don't operate. He knows that the people who are, who are trying to get him do not operate in the daytime. They only operate at night. So I, our thinking was if, if, if vehicles are driving through a town or an area at this time, nobody's going to suspect that those vehicles are going to go there. So that was the thinking. And we were right. And like literally, we were able to pull right up to this dude, one of his many compounds, jumped out of the vehicle, climbed over this wall. He was as soon as we I got over the wall, he was he was he was sitting there outside because the drone had him outside eating lunch, whatever he was doing. Uh, he squirted, so he saw us. So literally, everything worked up until that point, and then he squirted over the wall. There was a big farm massive farmland with crops all the way up to you know 13 feet high so he, he i mean his location was strategic for a reason so he squirted and then foot race 130 degrees full body guy and med bag oh. just nuts and then it just turned into a lot it was and then there was gunfire we didn't know where it was coming from and they had to move to another and then they, he jumped into a garbage truck so it turned into a vehicle chase and he went to this other place he had to go through this out of the <laughs> areas we had to crawl into the swamp come out of the swamp and it was nuts man it was easy and turning that was a kick in the nuts man it was kicking the nuts it was 14 hours we finally like my oic was just like hey dude like we like he's not going anywhere prince got him Let's just bed down and wait for the rest of our platoon to, to meet up with us because our rest of our platoon was uh, uh, pulling QRF on uh, at, at the fob. So we had the platoon meet up with us, like I want to say midnight, one in the morning. And drone was on. He didn't know drone was on the entire time. And, and uh, we, uh, we decided to insert, I want to say like three, four miles away from where he was. It's, like a very rural area. And uh, and then we essentially snuck our way, like literally tiptoed our way for like miles to this area, to this house. And like I said, physically it was, the whole op was, was gnarly. And then we, 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 we caught him, we wrapped him up. Um, um, so that was that, but yeah, I had, like I remember I did this other op where we came on a detail about, but um, it was in the country that, you know, but that was a, that was a crazy one. That was a crazy one. That would mean we had to recover. We had to recover something um, in this particular country, and uh, it was just me and my OIC. No and, way. Uh, Damn. Yeah. And, uh, and and it's more to the story, but we didn't have we, we didn't have approval. We didn't have this is how crazy that was. It was a national level, like we were doing a national level going to each other office, and we reached out to the. The amb- our closest cure act was on another continent. And <laughs> we, we reached out to the embassy for approval to go do this op. And embassy said no. The, the uh, ambassador at the embassy at the embassy said absolutely not. Next person down said absolutely not. Finally, after we asked for approval, the defense attache um, reached out to my wife. He was like, all right, you guys can do it. But like, I'm not supposed to prove this. Like, he's like, I'm not telling the people that hey, don't get caught, don't get killed. And, uh, yeah, so that was, that was can, crazy. Remy, can you say how you infilled at least? Uh, let's just say that they were vehicles that were not military vehicles. Okay. Oh, we were in this country, cool. so they, they couldn't be vehicles that were, that looked like anything Western. Yeah. I'll, I'll just, that was, that was a crazy that was a, that was crazy. Did you come out of that one with your OIC? Like, I, I don't know if it was hairy on the objective or if everything went as planned, which maybe it did. 
But when you came out on the other side, were you guys just like, holy crap, I can't believe that worked? Uh, I, I can't, I mean, I can't remember if it was that feeling. Just, I think the defense attache, attache was like, holy crap. I think <laughs> <laughs> like, he was just hoping he never heard your name. I, I, I think it was more so him, like, ah, I'm not going to lose my job and, like, be freaking kicked out of the military for like, approving something that, you know, the two guys ahead of me had not approved. Yeah. I think, I, I think, I think for us, it was just a confidence that we know we could pull this thing off. And it was just more of the uh, uh, powers and powers that be that were like, do not, we cannot afford. And then another crazy thing that I always hated. Um, was every time t- towards the and I, I, I fell in like my three deployments that I did I fell into this cycle where each deployment the end of each deployment was like September October so you know we have an election cycle every freaking you know every other yeah. November and I always fell into these election cycles so what would often happen is like you know it would come down from presidents and, con- and congressmen and women and say, hey, like, you know, let's dial it back or whatever. This and that, no, I, it's, it happens every year. It's political, but it happens every year because, you know, you know, it's, nobody wants something to go yeah. wrong and like, and makes the news and then the president loses points, election points because of that. So like, or the, this particular, you know, person on this committee, you know, loses election points. So I found that was the most frustrating thing. Is it? Yeah. I was going to say, how about on the, on that human side? I don't know if you did that for all your deployments or not, Remy, or if they just knew that you were good at it. So they kept you doing it. Was yeah. there ever a time where you went out and collected some Intel and you were like, Oh my God, this is a jackpot right here. Like, I can't even believe I got um, this. Oh, uh, from the source? Um, yeah. Or was there ever like a, well, did you, know, you get I, into I, a I, trap? I, not, I would say, I would say, I would say no, because as you know, being in the business, just having one piece of human intel is never enough. Yeah. Never enough. It's just a small piece of the puzzle. You know what I mean? And so it was always like, if, if now if I had intel from another handler who had intel from another handler about this particular thing or whatever the case may be, then yeah, like that could be a big thing. But if it was like, if I'm just hearing something for the first time or probably like, just throwing this out there, not saying that this would be as off, like a dude was like, oh, Osama bin Laden is a Pakistan, this thing. Like, I'm not going to get excited about that because, you know, I mean, you know how it is, dude. You know how these sources freaking blow smoke and lie yep. or, you know, say stuff or embellish or exaggerate, whatever. Like, so, like, for me, like, even if they were telling the truth, it was like, well, I still got to, I still got to vet this information. Like, it has to be corroborated. And, you know, we got to use it, got to look at other intelligence reports, got to talk to other handlers, got to, you know, just look at drone feeds and all the stuff to confirm the intel. So it's like, you know, no, no it was never exciting when I got it. Because it was, because it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like in Hollywood, man. Like, you know, every every studio executive that gets pitched a project from a producer is like, the producer, oh, yeah, I got Brad Pitt. It's best I'm ever. Like, yeah, I got Brad Pitt <laughs> signed on. I got financing. I got all of this. And it's like, yeah, I've heard that a million times. You know, once yeah. you have money in escrow, once you have Brad Pitt, the signed contract with Brad Pitt signed on to make the movie, then we can have a conversation. But it's like, Come on, you, 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 once, once you hear these things, I mean, you hear it all the time. You know, it's like seeing is believing, you know. What, um, what was the decision to get out? Where did uh, that come about? I had two kids, my two sons. My oldest son was born in uh, 2014. My second son was born in 2015. And, you know, it was like, do I, do I stay in? And, and I was on track to deploy and it was like do I stay in and go through a workup cycle and deploy and be away from my kids or do I get out so uh you know my contract was up January 2016 so I was just like you know what you know I had a great life in the military did a lot of great things for me and I got a family now I got two kids I want to be a father too and uh I was just like you know I'm ready to move on you know I'm ready to be I'm ready to be live a normal life you know what I mean and, and, and have a life with my kids and my wife and my kids you know so was it tough to walk away from from that regard 
Uh, Not really. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, it was like, I remember questioning my decision to get out and then, you know, so it was tough. And then after I got out, it was like, all right, I'm out now. You know what I mean? Like, don't, I don't have that military ID anymore. I don't have that, like, you know, because that military ID, man, <laughs> gets you a lot. So I was like, when I, when I didn't have a military ID anymore, I was like, all right, this is real. Didn't have the paycheck anymore, first and 15th. Um, but, uh, but I was, you know, going back to what I said earlier, I was confident in my skills, what I had learned, um, the mind that I had that, you know, I, I, I knew it, I'd, I'd figured it out at some point. So. And, and was the goal Hollywood? Or no, no, it was no. just find something else. No, the goal was, the goal was twofold. Like one was like, I, I, I wanted to go into ministry. And then uh, the other big one was I wanted to, um, be going to business consulting, you know, taking principles that I learned, special operations, communication, leadership, um, critical thinking, mental toughness, teamwork, take those principles, package them and teach them to uh, corporations and pro athletes. And I kind of had been doing that. And I did do that. Uh, and I still do do that. Um, but that was the goal. I was actually in grad school when I got out, you know, uh, getting my master's in organizational strategy, it was a business degree. Like I could have done an MBA program, but I, I opted to, to go more into this, something different because, you know, MBA is a dime a dozen. So I, I decided to, uh, to go this or this business organizational strategy route. And so I did that because I figured, you know, that couple of my experience in, in, in the military, not just in the teens, but, in, you know, serving as a corpsman of Marines, that all, you know, gives me the uh, credibility as well as the uh, experience to teach executives and to uh, do executive leadership and uh, teach athletes and all that. So that was the main plan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of didn't work out as expected. I'd say kind of because I had clients, but it wasn't as consistent as I needed to be to pay a mortgage in Southern, Southern California and raise two, two kids at the time, four, but two kids at the time. And, and, uh, my wife's a, you know, a physician. So she was, uh, I think she was done with residency when I got out, but, you know, she started out working at a community clinic, which wasn't paying a lot of money. Um, and, uh, so, you know, that was January, 2016. And then, Fast forward to May is when I got the when I got the call to work on Transformers, and that was the film that uh, that kind of launched me into Hollywood. You but, know I mean? Remy, how did you get the call? Like, d- yeah. did you have to hustle for it or what? No, no, no. I was in, dude. I was in. I was at my computer. I was at this desk. I was in a different house, but this is my office now. I had a, I, had a, I lived in a um, three story house, and the third floor was all the loft. It was essentially my office. And I was at this desk at this computer writing papers for grad school. And this lady reached out to me, work with Bay, and was essentially like, hey, you know, Bay's looking for a guy with your background to work on this next project, this Transformer. Would you be interested? And uh, I said, yeah, sure, why not? I don't have anything going on. Like, I mean, I had flexibility because I was, you know, I, you know, I was pretty uh, disciplined when it came to my papers, like wanting to get them done, get them in. And, uh, and so I said, sure. And uh, she was like, send me some pictures. I was like, well, I don't have headshots or anything. Like, she said, let me headshots, just send me some pictures of your military uniform. And I did. And you weren't even auditioning? Remy? No, no, no. That, my audition was send me. Damn. My audition was two questions. One, would you like to do this tomorrow? I was like, yeah, I ain't got nothing going on tomorrow. And two, send me some pictures of you and your military. And I did that. And the next day I was on set. And that one day turned into three days. And that three days turned into, no, that one day turned into, yeah, that one day turned into like three weeks. Three weeks turned into, you know, I was on that film. I started in May, the end of May. I wrapped in December. Uh, I flew to, I, I filmed in Michigan, I filmed in San Diego, I filmed in Arizona, filmed in London, filmed in Wales. So, um, yeah, that was my first project. And then after that, you know, I was able to be blessed to get some other gigs, some commercials, and then that momentum kept going and worked on SEAL Team. And then Michael Bay asked me to work on his next movie after Transformers, which was Six Underground for Netflix. And 
and as a consultant, so I, I had to work as a consultant on that. And that was where I, I really realized that I, I learned a lot about the business and I learned that, hey, I don't want to be an actor. Like, I want to be a writer, director. And I, I was starting out, I want to be a writer. Wow. Because I would get these screenplays for these projects and I was asked to consult on them. I would read them and I would just be like, man, like, some of this stuff sucks or some of this, some of this stuff that makes it, it's not even like authentic or realistic. And I was just like, I could write this stuff. Like I know this world and I could do this. So I wrote my first screenplay, which was the chameleon. And that's the screenplay that got picked up by a company. I can't mention that company name, but then that's also the screenplay that after I finished writing, um, cause well, so I wrote the screenplay and then put it on the shelf. Fast forward is more to the story, but uh, then I wrote my second screenplay, which is a true story about the first group of African Americans to serve in special operations. Um, it's called The Last Shall Be First. So I wrote that screenplay. It's my second screenplay. Um, and then uh, a buddy of mine introduced me to my, my now agent, uh, APA. He represents writers and directors. And that agent read my two screenplays, The Chameleon and The Last Shall Be First, signed me um, uh, as a writer. Um, about a couple weeks later, at the same time, I had sent those screenplays to a guy who had written a book who was looking for writers to adapt that book into a film. So he sent me the book and was like, hey, can you read it and adapt this into a film? And I read the book. I was like, ah, I want to do this as a film. I do this as a, as a limited series because the story is just so potent and there's so much here. Like, would it be, we want to do the story justice to just do it as a two-hour film. This needs to be like an eight-hour an eight hour uh, uh, anthology series. And so he was like, cool, cut the check. And uh, my agent negotiated that deal. That deal is a deal that got me in the Writers Guild of America. So it got me recognized as a professional screenwriter in the Hollywood business. And then, um, and then after I finished writing that project, my agent then shot the chameleon to you know around town and got picked up from a production company got fast forward through a lot of this and that production company had to go through like a year of rewrites on the screenplay finish a year screen, uh, of rewrites uh last may of t- may of 2021 attached the star to the lead role and then uh and then a couple weeks later a good buddy of mine actually used to work at work at the agency to taylor moore I'm not sure if you ever heard of the name. He's a writer. Um, he has a book called Downrange. Um, yeah. You should probably have him on your podcast, but he's yeah. a great dude, agency dude. Um, got out, became a thriller writer. We, you know, so he read the screenplay. He's like, man, the screenplay is awesome. He's like, I should introduce you to my literary agent, John Talbot, because he, you know, I mean, he's like, I, I see this book and this screenplay could be like an awesome book series. I don't know well, how did that work because I already got the screenplay already kind of set up, and typically it's you write the book first, that's the IP, you find a screenwriter and then, you know, get the rights option and then you turn it into a film. But I already had this film done. So he's like, well, let me introduce you to John. He introduced me to John Talbot, who's now my, my, my literary agent as an author, as a published author. And he read the screenplay. He's like, this could be an awesome book series that can go for years, maybe even decades. He said, you should consider doing this as a book series. And he was like, let's put a pitch together and shop this thing. So we put a pitch together and he shopped it, created a bidding war. HarperCollins, HarperCollins, William Murrow uh, picked up the, you know, won the, won, the, won the bidding war. And I signed that book deal, three book deal, almost at a million dollars last August and uh, turning in book one this upcoming week. And That's so. Awesome. And now the studio has to buy whatever studio we have in Atlantic with a studio. I think my, I think the producer who I can't mention him in his production. I think they went to Netflix. I think Netflix was uh, waiting, waiting because this producer has a film with Netflix. But um, uh, I think they're waiting for a director to attach to the project. But but that book series, all of that came and the chameleon I did came from. The human stuff I did, and it came from that chapter, The Chameleon, which turned into a screenplay, and then that screenplay is now a book, you know, and uh, IP, which is important now in Hollywood. How hard is it when they're rewriting, like, over a year's time, something that you put your time into? Like, it, is it tough on the ego at all? Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's extremely hard. It's extremely, it's, it's extremely hard. Stressful 
can lead you into depression. I know I found depression when I got some got notes. Uh, Wait, uh, Remy, are you, are you, it's hard to believe you would fall into, seriously, like in all sincerity, that you would like, you just seem like you overcome anything. Yeah, I eventually got out, but, but, you know, when you, writing is a very uh, personal thing, you know, it's a very personal thing and you pour your heart and soul into it. And, uh, and I'm all for criticism because that's the only way you get better. Um, But, you know, when you get notes that you don't agree with and you're like told that you have to execute on those notes, you know, it's extremely hard. And I remember uh, I was at, I was in my first year at the WGA when I was getting these notes and uh, my mentor, you have to do it. You have to have a mentor for your first year. My mentor, she's very tons of big movies and TV shows and stuff. And she gave me, I told her, I was like, Hey, I'm struggling because I'm getting like these notes. And like, I was like, well, what do you do with notes that you don't agree with? You find hard to, ch- to change. She said, well, she said, well, you got to find the reason behind the note because sometimes it's not, necessarily be a note like hey make this character this or do this there's a reason behind the note and and she said once you can I once you identify that reason behind the note then make that note but then execute on that note but execute in a way that's authentic to your full voice as a writer execute on that note in a way that will maintain the integrity of what you're trying to write and and the integrity of those characters whatever the case may be I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. And so that's what helped me. Because when she gave me that, because you gotta remember when you work with a big producer, that producer is like, hey, you gotta change this, 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 and this. And it's like, you wanna push back or it's hard for you to change it. Like that could be very like debilitating because it's like, I can't say this is my boss. Like it's not, I guess I can't just say, no, I'm not gonna do it. But that advice helped me a lot because I went back and made those, executed on those notes in a way that I I went back and examined those notes and really identified what the the producers were asking of me. And I got to the substratum of it. And then I I executed those notes in a way that was authentic to my voice, authentic to the characters in the situation. And those notes were, those changes were accepted. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what helped me. But again, it was a process of learning. And and I I didn't know when I first started, and that's why I was just like, I felt stuck and felt a little depression. I was just I talking to my wife about it. I was like, oh, this is too. But then that helped me. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Okay. And I got to get you out of here soon. You mentioned as we were setting up a school that you're, yeah. you were, yeah. are starting. Can yeah. you tell us a little more about that and where it came from? Yeah. So Muskegon Maritime uh, Charter School, and we're opening it in Muskegon, Michigan. It's a very depressed area, inner city. Um, and it's right on Michigan Lake. And uh, um, kind of, I'll kind of go back and say how it came about. Um, a guy by the name of Franklin Fudell, he reached, I actually reached out to uh, the motivator, the SEAL motivator's office, I'm going to say back in 2010, something like that. I can't remember. It was somewhere around 2000, maybe 9, 10, 11, 12, one of those years. And uh, he was like, hey, like, I'm in. I had a boxing club. They had a boxing club in Muskegon, Michigan. It was specifically an after-school program for these inner-city kids who are in this really rough area. And a lot of them don't have fathers. And he was just like, hey, can you send a SEAL out here to come speak to my kids? And uh, the motivator's office reached out to me. I guess a guy who worked there knew me. So he reached out to me, knowing that I came from the inner-city He was like, hey, would you be up for going, up, going out to uh, Muskegon, Michigan? I was like, yeah, sure. So I went up there and I spoke. Uh, you know, I had the kids do push-ups and spoke and, and uh, toured the Boston Club. And it was a really cool experience. And me and Franklin kind of became friends out of that. And we stayed in contact. So fast forward to about three, two and a half, three years ago, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, dude, he was like, I don't have the Boston Club anymore, but and I got rid of that. He's like, look what I, uh, uh, he, he, you know, he, look what I was like, a bunch of his companies and kind of got rid of it so he could have money and, it was just like, uh, I want to start this chart, this charter school. And, and he was looking at some big buildings and he, uh, he was like, Hey, but I don't want to charge start the school without you. Cause I want, I want your experience. I want your, you know, your curriculum. I want a military influence, all these things and your ideas, everything. Like I want, I want the school to be kind of founded around you and your life and, 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 is, and your experiences with education and military. So I was just like, yeah, absolutely. 
And so we started that process again. It was two, two and a half year process. And, and we're finally opening this fall. And we're starting out K through five. Uh, the school, the building that we own is fully paid for. Um, 76,000 square feet um, can hold 800 to 1,000 kids, two floors. Um, it was well maintained. It used to be a public school that, you know, because of budget cuts got cut down and say got uh got uh, closed down in like 2018 and then it became a continuing education school. They got closed down in 2019. And so we were able to get the building. It was well maintained. And yeah, it's, it's all about, you know, and I have this curriculum that I created called uh, OPS, uh, which stands for opportunity plus preparedness equals success. And so it's going to be a military themed school. Kids are going to have to wear uniforms, boys and girls school. Um, it's a maritime theme, which means, you know, the kids are going to have some, be able to get, learn some skills or get introduced to some skills that they can utilize because, you know, again, ski is right on a, on um, Michigan Lake, mm. it's type tons of job opportunities to work on ships or work in, you know, maritime engineering and, you know, sailing and all of these different things, awesome. you know, that, you know, these, a lot of people in the community don't even think of doing because they don't have the education or exposure to it. So we're exposing these kids at an early age and then we will give them great education and we'll hire some great teachers and, uh, it opens this fall. September 6th is when uh, when everything kicks off. Awesome. So, uh, and you're raising that. money, right? Is there a place yeah, where people can go to? Yeah, go to the, um, Muskegon Maritime Academy. Let me just double check because um, I have so much stuff going on that I tend to often forget the website. But um, uh, Muskegon, yeah, I was right. Muskegon Maritime Academy dot org. Yep. So uh, people can go there and donate. We've already raised seven hundred thousand in private private funding, um, and that's going to that a lot of that is going to our building. Um, um, obviously, we're still raising money for uniforms because we don't want the kids to pay for their uniforms because they can't afford it. Um, we're also raising money, like I told the reason why I was late because we want to want the kids to have good quality breakfast and lunch. Lunches we don't want them to have the garbage stuff that you know. A lot of these public schools give out. So yeah, we're still raising money and we just we just want to give the kids an opportunity to 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 be great. You know, and, and education is the foundation of, of any society and, and, and that's where it all starts. If you have a good education from the beginning, then that can help you go places if we want to give these kids opportunity to go places. So um yeah. So I got three questions for you before I let you out. There's two I ask everybody and one that I just really wanted to ask you in particular. So the two that I ask everybody, one is when you were going out on ops with the teams, was there anything that you always wanted to have with you, like a good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that had sentimental value that you carried with you? Uh, No, 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 it's just, you know, I just said my prayer, read my scripture before I went out and then. Yeah, no, I didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. So every now and then I get somebody who who's like, nope, just went out sterile, didn't want to take yeah. anything with me, no pictures, nothing. Um, next question is looking back at this time that you spent the the three deployments, even the, the folks that you just mentioned who who had passed away, you knew them in buds, presumably uh, on the teams. Yeah. Looking back at that, would you go back and do it again? Oh, absolutely, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And then the third question specifically for you, Remy, just thinking back to your old man, I know you didn't grow up with him, but like yeah. if he was looking at you now, what do you think he'd be saying? Uh, don't stop now. <laughs> there's more, there's more of the world to conquer. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. <laughs> don't rest on your laurels. <laughs> yeah. Man, I appreciate the time. Um, it's yeah. been so much fun for me. The book is great. I, I really yeah. encourage people to get out there and and read it. And yeah. obviously, they can see you in a whole slew of, uh, of films yeah. and shows. Yeah. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thanks for having me. It's been an honor, blessing, brother. Our first comment today comes from Chris Cully three seven five on the Taurus Chamut interview, and he says, "Again, you managed to get somebody on here." that probably no one else could get on their podcast. Always just amazed at who you get on here and how well you do with getting them to open up and talk about their experiences and just another great combat story. Then he's got the uh, acronym RLTW375, uh, Rangers Lead the Way. 
I bet you got an amazing story there as well, Chris. Thanks for, for leaving that comment. And yeah, Taurus was an interesting one to track down. Actually, put in contact from another listener, another former uh, Army vet. I won't mention the name, but I uh, thought it would be important for us to connect. I'm really glad he did, and I'm glad that it resonated. Thanks for leaving that. Our next comment is from Aggressive Calm on YouTube, and it's on the Joe Hotai interview. He says, engaging story, well told, with some very human reflection on what it's like having to decide not to kill an enemy. Thank you for your service, Joe. Yeah, Joe is just such a <laughs> an unassuming, peaceful, down-to-earth guy, uh, but to have been a double SAS, uh, Kiwi and Aussie, just says a whole lot about what's inside. But yeah, the, the human element of him is something on another level. So I'm glad it came through to you as well. And then I just wanted to include one more here. And that was on the Mike Sarai interview. And it's from Bill Burgart one. And he says, I'm currently on a tactical team that has major voids in leadership in reference to the attributes Mike talks about. I can only imagine the progress we'd make if we were all exposed to someone like him. So worthy of emulation. I'll be buying his book ASAP. Thank you for such a great interview and exposure. Yeah, actually that Mike Sarai one is a sleeper for me, like one of the my favorites that we've done. Just his background, what he came from, going um, Marine enlisted, recon, um, SEALs, dev grew, whole nine yards, and so successful on his way out. Um, that one, I was surprised it didn't get more traction but I think that the people who have heard it really got something out of it. So thanks for leaving that comment, Bill. Appreciate it. And you stay safe on the tactical teams, uh, wherever that is for you. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.